Now starting, all attendees are in listen only mode. Hello everybody, this is Andrea Leonard, president and founder of the Cancer Exercise Training Institute. Thank you for joining us live on this Tuesday afternoon. And if you are listening to the recording, thanks for joining us after the fact. I am really excited to have Dr. Dan Ritchie here with us today. Uh, we've actually decided to partner up on some things with FAI, and so this kind of brings it all together. And Dr. Dan Ritchie has a broad background in the fitness industry, including training and management in commercial, for-profit, non-for-profit, and educational facilities, and his expertise in personal training for special populations, including athletes, stroke recovery, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy, fibromyalgia, Alzheimer's, and on and on. In other words, Dr. Ritchie is great at everything, and he has also worked on state-funded research on exercise for severe dementia, uh, Alzheimer's type, and he regularly presents at national and regional conferences and has been active on committees for the American College of Sports Medicine. So uh, I don't know how I can follow that introduction, but he is going to be talking about the um, functional aging model and giving us an overview of the program. So uh, Dan, thank you for being here and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, thanks so much. I, uh, I could tell Celia gave you the long version of my bio instead of the short one, but that's that's all right. <laughs> she that's said right. it was the short one. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Uh, that, yeah, was, that was a lot for you to try to cover, but uh, happy to be I here. And, I wasn't sure how to pronounce it either, so. <laughs> and uh, we've got uh, quite a... To, go ahead. What's that? I was just to say, wanted to let everybody know that um, I'll be fielding questions. So uh, as you're talking, if people want to write anything into the question box um, at the end, we'll try and answer some of those questions. And uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of them. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it's fun for uh, for me, get, me to get to do the talking. I'm usually hosting people on webinars every week. So uh, today I get to talk about FAI stuff. So I'm going to talk about the functional aging training model. And I've got about... 20 minutes left at the end for live Q&A, so I'm going to talk for about 35, 40 minutes. But uh, but yeah, if you see a, a question that I need to stop and, and answer, please please interrupt. So, um, so we jokingly call it the FAT model for short, um, and some people are like, what is functional aging training? Well, that's really what we're going to talk about today. So before I get into the science behind that, I just want to give sort of a brief overview of who we are. Uh, Cody Seip is my business partner and co-founder in the Functional Aging Institute, also my partner at Miracles Fitness, now 11 years, a fitness studio uh, dedicated and committed to training uh, older adults, which is unique in its own right. Uh, this is who you're listening to if you've never seen me speak before. Um, the only thing I highlight here is 2014, I won the Personal Fitness Professional Magazine Personal Trainer of the Year. Uh, and Cody and I sort of marked that as, as really the first time the fitness industry started to take notice of people working with older adults. Um, and, and even still now in 2018, 90% um, of the fitness industry is still focused on, on youth and, and vanity and fitness and appearance and weight loss and, and still not really focused on the 60 plus population. Um, and we think there's a huge, huge opportunity and we're going to talk about that today. So. Um, we do have a advisory board, um, just so people realize it's not just stuff Cody and I made up, but we've got a series of uh, really smart people behind us. In fact, Sue Grant was our fall proof instructor uh, over 10 years ago. Uh, J.R. Burgess is a medical fitness person. Debbie Pillarella and Diane McCaughey teach workshops for us all around uh, the world, actually. Diane's been to South Korea and China for us. Uh, Debbie was just recently at a major uh, Canadian event in Toronto. So we've got people going all over the, the world for us. So just to kind of set the framework before we talk about why a functional aging training model and what it is, you need to realize we are at a time uh, in our country's history that we've never seen before. The 65 and older population is the fastest growing population in our country. Um, we've never seen that before. I mean, historically speaking, that would have never even made sense. Um, and we are exploding upwards, heading towards over 80 million people in the 65 and older population. If you look back to 1950, 
um, there were about 13 million people over the age of 65. If you look at the 85 and older population, you can see that's trending up to 20 million people. Uh, today in 2018, we're not even at 10 million. Um, we've just, just broken through the 7 million, so that's going to triple uh, in the next 30 years. And so our country is getting older, and what does that mean for us in terms of how we think about fitness programming? Um, currently, uh, the baby boom generation, every seven seconds, someone is turning 65. Uh, and now, actually, every seven seconds, someone is turning 70. Uh, the baby boom generation was the largest generation in history until the millennials came along and eclipsed them by about a million people. There's some debate as to how big the millennials are, but, but most say they're about 80 to 81 million. Of course, they're children of the baby boomers. Um, and the baby boomers happen to be the wealthiest generation in United States history as well. So it's a really interesting population to study. But we continue to say the fitness industry, by and large, is missing the mark tremendously when it comes to older adult fitness programming, senior fitness, um, just active aging, so many different um, acronyms and programs that are just really missing the mark. And, and we're really misunderstanding this population. Um, we see around the age of 50, 55, people start to move out of health club membership. They start to leave the traditional fitness space. Um, and a lot of that is simply because the services are, are just badly missing the mark. And um, we think aging in and of itself can still continues to get a bad rap, right? We see negative images even of Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Like even aging uh, got the best of him. And we see this in the media time and time again, right? That aging is to be avoided at all costs. Aging is bad. Growing old is, is a, a negative. Um, and, and the fitness industry, by and large, still embraces uh, newer, younger, uh, the next best thing. So when I think about the functional aging training model and why we designed this at the Functional Aging Institute, this is really uh, one of our driving passions, right? Why is it that some women in their 70s are living life in a very um, dependent, uh, assisted living type situation, um, really not enjoying their final years, uh, whereas other people in their 70s are clearly having a great time. Um, I don't know if she's at the beach or at a pool, but she's clearly uh, enjoying life. And so which life are you designing? Um, for most of us listening today, the question is, which life are you designing for your clients? So which would you choose, quality or quantity? So I'm going to pose this question to all of you. Uh, love to have you go ahead and enter it into the question box just so um, we can hear your feedback. But which would you choose if your choice was quality of life, let's say to age 80, maybe even 85, really high quality life, totally independent, high functioning, doing whatever it is you want, but your life's going to end at 80 to 85. Or quantity of life, you're going to live to 100, but from age 80 to 100, your quality of life might not be so good. In fact, the last 10 years of your life, you might live in a nursing home uh, with someone else feeding you. So which would you choose, quality or quantity? So, Andrea, if you want to shout out a couple of those. Yeah, at me. I was just going to say, I'm really good at interrupting, so I don't want to do it too often. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's it's going to be on my epitaph. But uh, everybody unanimously, quality, quality, quality. Uh, yep, yep. They're just going one after the other without a doubt. There's usually there's usually one person in the room who's like, I'll take my <laughs> chances, right? And, and usually that's yeah, someone yeah. who thinks they're going to beat it, right? And I'm like, well, what if what if you could have quantity and quality? And that's that's really what we talk about when we talk about functional longevity. Uh, it's it's what we call maintaining your ability to do what you need to do. Right. So basic activities of daily living. Right. I got to dress myself. I got to bathe. I've got to feed myself. I've got to do basic household tasks, things I need to do. Right. I've got to maintain that ability. Right. But then it's also what about things I want to do and things I'd like to do as late in life as possible. And so if I'm still doing need to do, want to do, like to do things at age 87, 90, 92, whatever it is, then I'm still functioning really well. I've combined quality with quantity of life. And so I love this image of 
I, I'm assuming a grandfather playing wiffle ball in the backyard, right? Things that we want to do and like to do uh, as late in life as possible. So we know that genetics really only accounts for about 25% of aging. So what that means is 75% of it is really up to you. In fact, when we really look at the genetic research, most of the genetics account for people living to 100 and beyond. And so if you're sitting there thinking, well, gee, my parents only lived into their 70s, the reality is you still control 75% of the likelihood that you're going to live really well into your 90s. Um, so it's really the genetics is stronger for, for people that have family history of living to 100 and beyond. And so the reality is most of us can anticipate living into our 90s. How well we do that is very much up to us and under our control. So when we look at the concept of aging, um, I think a lot of times aging gets a bad rap, right? We think aging is a negative thing, right? Aging is happening to all of us. But the reality is it's really secondary aging that is the culprit of people growing old and people having negative health outcomes. And so we have this image of a senior athlete. Here's someone clearly older in age, but out there competing. You can even tell just by looking at his arms and legs. He's got good muscularity. And we have the image of the astronaut. The astronaut goes through secondary aging in an accelerated way, right? Why is it that astronauts come back from space and they have osteopenia or even osteoporosis? They have sarcopenia. They have all these secondary aging characteristics because they're in a no gravity environment. And so we realize lifestyle, activity, sedentary living accelerates or accentuates secondary aging right? So just think of yourself, right? If I were to tell you, okay, for the next month, you're going to be stricken with some sort of illness that requires you to be bedridden or hospital bound for a month. Can you imagine what your secondary aging would be like um, a month from now, right? So we realize that primary aging is happening to all of us. We can't stop that. We are getting older. At, our biology is aging. Uh, we are going to end at some point, right? You're going to live to 85, 95, or 105. The question is, what does your secondary aging look like? And so I always throw this question in. Now, I know the fitness pros here will know the answer to this, so we won't even ask for their response here, Andrea. But I always pose this to older adults I'm lecturing with because there's a lot of myths out there, right? People think, oh, well, my doctor said I should walk, right? Walking is the best type of exercise. Well, Walking is one of the most affordable types of exercise. It's one of the most accessible and it's one of the easiest, but it's certainly not the best exercise at maintaining functional strength, lower body strength, doesn't maintain our ability to climb stairs, doesn't help me with getting up and down from the floor. And so then people think, well, I should do strength training, right? Because strength training must be the fountain of youth. And of course, the research has shown time and time again that it's not strength training. And then, of course, there's usually someone smart in the room who's like, well, it must be both, right? Combine them both. And that's not the answer either, right? So really, neither of them are best. We're going to see as we dive into the functional aging training model that it has to be much, much more complex and much more robust. So I love that people walk and our walkers totally encourage them to do it. It is not sufficient for older adults that want to maintain their functional longevity. And so if you have um, relatives or patients or clients that come to you and they're like, oh, I'm a regular walker. My doctor told me to walk. That's great. Don't discourage that. Say, hey, that's great that your doctor encouraged you to move. But does your doctor realize that it's not sufficient for you to maintain your function? It's not sufficient for you to maintain your balance. It's not sufficient for you to maintain your strength. You need to do more, right? Uh, obviously, it's easy and convenient. Um, if you live in a lovely place like Andrea does, you can probably do it year round. Uh, here, here wait, wait, in, do you remember where I live, Dan? <laughs> here, here in Indiana, you cannot do it year round, so it's yeah, not quite as convenient. I am in Portland, Oregon, so I'm not okay. fond of uh, getting soaked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. You have rainy weather. That's true, but at least it's yeah. at least it's warmer than here. So, yeah, yeah. So strength training safe. Um, it will improve muscle mass. But the interesting thing we're going to look at is that strength gains rarely translate to functional gains or even functional ability. And so sometimes we overhype strength training and we say, well, if we just keep, you know, our seniors strong, then we'll solve all their problems. And the reality is 
over 100 research studies have showed that is just not the case. So we're going to dive into that just a little bit deeper. So both have limitations. Um, I'm going to show a few research studies. Bear with me. Um, in 2001, um, a review of 31 studies looked at strength, range of motion, aerobic capacity, and body composition. And then they looked at some functional measures, um, walking, chair rise, ability to get out of a chair, up and down from the floor, balance, um, but just a bunch of different functional measures. Then they looked at disability scores. The results are really interesting. Um, what we would hope and what we would expect, actually, is that the impairments get better, right? If we're training strength, people get stronger. If we're training range of motion, range of motion improves. Aerobic capacity, body composition. So if you look at the results, the impairments, very strong results. However, when you translate that to function and disability, it gets much more inconsistent. In fact, the disability scores weren't changing at all. Um, so these researchers actually titled the, the paper, Have We Oversold the Benefits of Late Life Exercise? Which Cody and I, of course, starting our PhDs at, at this time, were like, there's no way we've oversold it. Um, so we were really interested to see their next round. 2004, uh, they did a lot of work for us. They looked at 62 research studies. Now, these were progressive resistance training studies in older adults. Everyone's over the age of 60. Randomized controlled trials. So we're not controlling who's weak, who's strong, any of that. It's all random. And again, large positive effect on muscular strength. We can get people stronger. And we've seen this even training people in their 90s and early 100s. Large positive effect on muscular strength. People get substantially stronger. However, we don't see that in terms of functional ability. If you notice, the results were very small. In some cases, moderate effect on functional ability. Strength gains were not equating to similar functional gains. So if we saw a 50% increase in muscular strength, we might see a 10% increase in functional scores. And then even worse, there was no evidence of an effect found for physical disability, which was really, really disappointing. And we're gonna talk a little bit why why this is here in just a moment. 2007, they finally added something to the strength component. They added some cardio and balance training. Uh, Cody and I actually believe it's the balance training that had the, the positive effect more so than the cardio. Um, we finally see a positive effect on falls prevention, but still small effects on physical, functional, and quality of life outcomes, which in the end is really what most people over 60 want, right? It's like, okay, that was great. I got 50% stronger, but it's not translating to my life. So what can we do better? So 2011, um, this is really what sort of led us to say, hey, people need to become more aware of the functional aging training model, which we were developing at Miracles Fitness now uh, about five years into training several thousand clients. Um, again, they're just not finding huge impacts on disability. So again, they're doing strength training, aerobic exercise. They're trying to mitigate knee pain uh, due to osteoarthritis. And again, the effects on strength, pain, and function were modest at best. Um, and their takeaway that effective interventions for minimizing disability were scarce and novel approaches were needed really sort of spurred us to say, hey, we need to we need to share our model, because if you're just doing strength training, you will just improve strength. And so when we start to look at how a human functions, we start to realize, yeah, it sort of makes sense. We need to do a lot more complex movement, a lot more diversity um, in the functional aging specialist course. Uh, we dive into a lot more research studies, and in the last oh, eight to ten years, since about 2010, there's been a lot more interest in power training, balance training, um, even obstacle negotiation and what we call task-specific training, where we're starting to see if you train someone for a specific task, like getting up and down from the floor, they will get better at that. Um, just like we saw, if you train someone for strength training, they will get better at strength, but not necessarily at function, right? And so when you go back and look at over 100 strength training studies, you realize most of them are machine-based, isolation-based movements. If they do use equipment like dumbbells or free weights, they're still very isolated type movements like an arm curl. Um, and so you start to realize, well, yeah, they got stronger at that specific task and it didn't translate to things like climbing stairs and functioning. So, so as we get into our model, you'll start to see 
yeah, we're going to take some strength training components and then we're going to combine it with a lot of things from mobility to balance to reaction time to cardiovascular fitness, uh, even some cognitive training skills. And so when we look at the Nagi model, which was revised by Rickley and Jones in 1997, which boggles my mind now. Uh, that was when I graduated university a um, long time ago. Um, they revised this model and they added lifestyle and inactivity. And so obviously we realize now that it's not just disease or pathology that leads to impairment. It can simply be poor lifestyle, sedentary living, sitting around too much, a variety of things that leads to a physical impairment, right? I don't have as good a strength or as good a balance, as good a reaction time. I have some sort of physical impairment. That eventually leads to a functional limitation, right? My ability to climb stairs without using a railing uh, is a functional limitation, right? Can eventually lead to a disability, right? I simply cannot go up and down stairs, right? Disabilities come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and flavors, right? Like I don't uh, have difficulty dressing myself. I can't fasten my own bra can't go up or down stairs, can't get down on the floor, have trouble getting in and out of a car. I mean, there's so many different things, even things like I'm afraid to go out at night could be a disability measure. So what we wanna look at in the functional aging training model, how do we train enough impairment level factors so people have less functional limitations and ideally no functional limitations? So what impairment level factors are vital for function? I want you to think of just a handful right now. You don't have to shout them out because you'd overwhelm Andrea probably with hundreds of them. But things like strength we've talked about, certainly that's an impairment level factor that's vital for function. Power is another one. Balance is another one. Motor control. Um, there are so many. Um, this is not by any means an exhaustive list. But when you start to see muscular strength and you look at the research and you're like, oh my goodness, there were over 100 research studies and they're almost all concentric muscular strength, well, yeah, for sure they're not going to have a huge impact on disability or function, right? What if half of their subjects were having trouble with motor control and proprioception and somatosensation, the, the feeling in their feet, their reaction time, their coordination, their joint range of motion? If I improve their strength, I, I might not make much of an impact uh, on them at all. In fact, one research study I looked at, we got the men stronger Research study got the men stronger, their balance scores got worse. Um, but all they did was one simple thing. They just trained them on the leg press. They got them stronger, significantly stronger, but their balance scores actually got worse. They got less stable on some balance measures. So um, there are a lot of factors. Uh, we've put it in what we call a physical function model. And we really think there are six domains that help people function well. Now. Some people could argue there might be a seventh or an eighth, and that's fine. But if we just break it down into six different categories, musculoskeletal, you'll see off on the, the blue on the right, there's strength. Certainly strength is important. I am not saying strength isn't important. Don't take that away from my talk today. What I am saying is that strength is only one piece of the puzzle. And we have to train all of these if we want to really train the older adult for maximal functional longevity. And so you can see the neuromuscular piece where we have motor control and proprioception, coordination, reaction time. Cognitive emotional is huge, right? Brain health, motivation, memory, pain, problem solving, confidence. We have clients come in that balance actually isn't their issue. It's purely confidence. They don't believe they can do something. And so therefore they're moving less. Um, and we have to improve their confidence and their success. Uh, mobility, balance, cardiorespiratory, I think, Andrea, have, yep. So you can see it gets even more complex as we dive into it, right? I mean, look how complex balance is um, in terms of multisensory fitness, postural strategies. Um, obviously, proprioception is a very complex topic to train in and of itself. And so this sort of sets the foundation for the functional aging training model. We say, Sure, strength training is great, and it's an important piece, but we have to be doing power. We have to be doing muscular endurance. We have to be doing things for joint integrity. That's just musculoskeletal. And oh, by the way, we wanna to try to hit all six of these across a training cycle, across a week or two weeks. And some clients may need more balance. Some clients may need more strength. Some clients might need more mobility. Um, and not all clients are equal in what they're gonna need. 
So last research study I'm going to share with you, I think it's the last one, I promise, um, <laughs> is that there's a large degree of variability between individuals. Um, most of us have heard of the term osteopenia, which is age-related decline in bone mass. Most of us have heard of sarcopenia, age-related decline in muscle mass. The reality is it's very individualized, but we talk about it population-wise, right? So here's a, an older research study, solid study, solid statistics. They don't violate science or any of that. And, and we draw from this and we say muscle strength declines 30% on average from age 50 to 70, and we see more dramatic losses after age 80. Well, that muscle strength declines 30% on average is coming from this crazy plot chart here. You can see all the black dots and that straight line. Well, that straight line is a good statistical analysis that does show uh, over the age span from 50 to 70, muscle strength does decline. What it doesn't show when you hear that reported in research studies or in the news or latest fitness tips, what it doesn't show is all the individuals, right? And so the individual on the very bottom, this tiny little dot here, this 73 year old that has the lowest muscle mass, strength is gonna be one of the most important things you can do for them. The opposite of the person way up here on the top who's in their 60s and they have the most muscle mass, this is that person who probably will never ever have a strength issue, no matter how they decline, right? And so it just shows there's a large, large degree of variability between individuals. And so we have to be careful when we say, well, on average, muscle strength declines 30%. Well, yeah, on average, but no one is average, right? So it just shows we have a mass of people that then we fit an average to. And so we have to be careful when we think about the individual who has unique needs. This is why we show this chart, right? It's why some people at 70, 80, 90 years old are living on the blue line, totally high functioning, doing whatever it is they wanna do. Whereas other people at the same age are crossing a disability threshold. They're thinking about moving into a nursing home or a retirement community, or I gotta move in with my daughter because I just can't take care of myself. And they're the same age, right? We have this wide, wide range of function in individuals. What we really wanna do is maximize people living on the blue line. I tell fitness professionals, Andrew, all the time, you're not selling fitness, you're selling the blue line, right? Like people wanna live as long as they can, as well as they can. And so we're selling that upper trajectory of aging and what life can look like. <laughs> can I interject something, Dan? Yep. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because, of course, uh, working with cancer patients, um, you know, you're taking many of them obviously are, are the baby boomers, um, but they've got a lot of additional uh, de debilitating aftermaths and so on and so forth. But it's also giving people confidence. And that was in your, your kind of hierarchy. But I see so many people who are afraid. And I'm seeing that right now with my mom, who's going to be 80 in September. She's had breast cancer twice and thyroid cancer. And, you know, on one hand, she's got nine lives. But she, you know, I've been trying to get her to exercise. And here I am. Here, mom, I wrote a book. Here, mom, I wrote another book. And, you know, that generation, it's the same thing. I hear from her, well, you know, I'm walking and this and that. And she's afraid. She's afraid of pain. She's afraid of falling. She's afraid of being alone and not having anybody there to help her. And that can be completely crippling. So, you know, I think you kind of touched on that, but I just wanted to elaborate because I see this so often. Yeah, absolutely. And, and cancer, um, you know, if you look at the chart here, you can be moving along on the blue line at a very high level of function. And all of a sudden at age 60, you get a cancer diagnosis and 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 you survive it. Right. And you beat it. And maybe you spend one to two years fighting it um, and it alters your trajectory of aging. And if you're not paying attention to it, like, hey, I have got to restore my health fully, right? I mean, you, you go through waves of chemotherapy and radiation and some other cancer treatments, and it's going to strip muscle off your body. You've got, to, you've got to rebuild that. And so, um, and cancer is just one example, right? I mean, there are other diseases that people face and other life events. And there are times where you might be taking care of someone or your, your life changes and you can have interruptions in your trajectory. And all of a sudden, 
you have been pulled to a different trajectory of aging. And I tell people you you have got to restore that. And so cancer for sure, other adverse health events, you've got to regain your highest level of function. And, and you're only going to do that really through significant training. You're not going to just regain the muscle you lost um, through walking or you know just going about your your regular activities you're going to have to train to do that you're going to have to work hard uh, to build it back so there are a lot of well, different and it's things unfortunate. yeah it's unfortunate i mentioned this in the webinar last week that you know the, the majority of medical professionals i mean they're not trained in exercise just like nope. we're not trained to be medical doctors and so the the general you know statement from them is exercise but right. the patients right. you know w whether they're just a, a healthy 70 year old or somebody who's fighting cancer or you know diabetes or whatever they're like okay well now what so they're going to us as fitness professionals and those of us who are working with this population have to understand understand all these intricacies because not only do we not get the results that we want but we can end up hurting our clients so i i love what you're saying yeah yeah absolutely absolutely Okay, so um, <clears throat> Sperduso came out with five levels of a hierarchy of physical function, and there were five characteristics, elite athlete, fit, independent, frail, and dependent, and we actually, um, we found that very useful, uh, a nice tool, um, but we felt like it needed to be broken out much further because now, as baby boomers are aging, uh, we're seeing much more diversity, and it, it probably could be 10 or 12 categories, but we've We've broken out the hierarchy of physical function to the elite athlete, the fully fit, the semi-fit, higher independent, lower independent, pre-frail, frail, and dependent. Now, most everyone listening today, unless you actually work in a nursing home environment, are probably not going to be working with the dependent individual. Most of us are going to be working with the, the fully fit to the pre-frail. Now, the fully fit is that active older adult. Uh, you, you can see the image here of downhill skiing. It's really someone that can, can do anything with us, right? I mean, like, hey, you want to go play softball? Sure. You want to go water skiing? Sure. You want to go hiking? Whatever it is, they're, they're fully fit. They can do any activity. The elite athlete is a growing um, population, but it's still a teeny, teeny tiny niche, um, but that's going to continue to grow. The semi-fit, we show someone here participating in like a 5K race right there they certainly have a level of fitness um, but there might be some things they can't do um, then we get into a large percentage of our aging population the higher independent lower independent and the pre-frail um, these are the people in most cases their doctor would say they're doing just fine right you're pretty healthy you're not on any major medications the pre-frail person might be on blood pressure meds and maybe a few things for arthritis as needed but you're doing pretty good but you're like, wait a minute, they're pretty frail. They're really not doing as well as they could be doing. Um, even the lower independent person, about the most physically robust thing they do is what we have them pictured here doing, right? They cook, right? They they host people for dinner. They, they still host Thanksgiving, but that's about the most physically demanding thing they do. And so we see this as a huge opportunity uh, to help these people live uh, even more functional and vibrant lives. So why do traditional exercise programs fail to maximize functional ability in older adults? In, in our view, there are a couple of simple uh, reasons. They're not training all the different impairment factors. In most cases, they're training strength and they're training cardio, or they're just doing one of those, right? Um, my doctor recommended I exercise, so therefore I took up a walking program, or I took up swimming, or I took up cycling. Um, or I joined a strength training circuit, um, and typically they're doing one uh, or two things. And so we think there just has to be a little bit more to it than that. Um, so we've got what we call our four, four cornerstones, two pillars, and seven principles. And I will kind of wrap up with this, which is sort of the foundation of, of how we certify and train trainers and the functional aging specialists. So we think... Um, the fitness professional needs to have an in-depth understanding of the aging process and its implications for exercise, which means you need to be comfortable saying, you know, walking is not sufficient or strength training alone is not sufficient. And there are a lot of implications for how we train uh, the older adult. A recognition of the desires, goals, and aspirations that accompany the third age, right? We have to recognize that 
people in their 60s and 70s have different goals, different fitness goals, different outcomes, different things they want to do. And we've got to recognize that. A strong belief that people can be fit, healthy, vibrant, and functional at any age. At any age, I don't care whether it's 98 or 107, if they're alive, they can be fit, healthy, vibrant, and functional at any age. And so we really have to be believing that. And we've got to start looking into more and more stories like Banana George Blair, water skiing at the age of 98. Uh, Google Dr. Charles Eukster, E-U-G-S-T-E-R. Dr. Charles Eukster wakeboarding, and you'll see images of him. He decided, I've never done this. I want to try wakeboarding. He happened to be 94 years old at the time, right? So we have to have a strong belief that people can be vibrant and functional at any age. An approach to exercise that's grounded in evidence and honed with experience. Two pillars. This is really why I think most traditional exercise programming doesn't work for older adults. It's not specific. It doesn't train to how they want to gain. It doesn't correlate the exercise to the functional goal, right? I see trainers that are like, oh, I got my 82-year-old client doing a 100-pound barbell bench press. Why and who cares, right? It's like, to what functional goal does that correlate? So specific adaptation to increased demand, right? We've got to be training people for life, for things they want to do. And then I think the other thing is we're really afraid to overload clients, right? Because they're like, well, but they're 82. I don't know if I can overload them. Well, guess what? Their physiology doesn't adapt if we don't overload it. So we've got to find ways to stimulate their physiology to further improve, right? And so these two are pretty simple. We've known these in physiology and in fitness pretty much our entire fitness careers. Um, but a lot of times we're a little bit afraid to do some of these with older adults. And then we have seven principles um, and a lot of these are based on the evidence and what we've seen in the research, but some of it's based on our experience. We've got to be training all those components of function that I talked about earlier. And that's not an easy thing to do. And I would say that's why it's really hard to design the perfect workout, because I don't think you can get everything you need to get done in one workout. So you have to be thinking about a series of exercise sessions over the course of a week, two weeks, three weeks. That's why we're always changing our training sessions here at Miracles Fitness. You got to be purposeful for every aspect of training. Like we don't just do exercises because we did them with other clients or we learned them in a fitness conference. Like, why am I doing this for this client at this time in the session? We've got to train in all three planes of human movement. Um, that was a huge takeaway from the research studies time and time again. Um, so much of the training is sagittal plane, sagittal plane, sagittal plane. Um, but we, we move in all three planes. So, Challenge for everyone listening, because uh, sometimes people are like, well, but sagittal planes are dominant movement plane. Well, absolutely it is. Um, but try to get in and out of a car. Just try it this afternoon. Try to get in and out of a car in only the sagittal plane. Um, you'll find it quite difficult. So include isolation type exercise movements as supplementary and complementary rather than primary. Um, doesn't mean we throw them out. An arm curl is a functional exercise. It just needs to be a supplementary and complementary rather than primary. Um, I like leg presses and other isolation type exercises, but they should be complementary, not primary. Perform exercise movements in a seated position only when absolutely necessary. In other words, do as many possible things as you can standing because that's really where we need to be training to function better. Order the session according to energy level, multi-component, -comp complex, earlier, isolation type movements later and then always maximize client safety doesn't do you any good to have a pre-frail fall risk client fall down in one of your sessions because you're not thinking about safety so lastly is the exercise safe and effective some exercises don't fulfill any purpose with certain clients and other clients they fulfill a purpose right if i have a 70 year old client that wants to downhill ski I'm going to have to do some high impact, some power activities, probably even some hopping and shifting weight and, and high stress um, type activities. And if the next client has no interest in doing anything more uh, physical than hiking with their grandchildren, I probably don't need to do high impact jumping uh, types of activities. So one exercise might be safe and effective for one client and not the same for the other. So the risk benefit ratio 
changes and the specificity and the appropriateness changes uh, depending on the client. And this is something we really, really have to keep in mind when we're training people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. So our course is fairly straightforward. It's the functional aging specialist. We also have a functional aging group exercise specialist, very similar course. Um, there are 13 educational modules, five hours of video, about five hours of reading. Um, there's a very fun 90 question online exam, um, which actually which actually we've broken into three 30 question exams. So it's not quite as bad as one giant exam all at one shot. Um, and we have um, functionalagentinstitute.com and you can email us at contact at functionalagentinstitute.com. But we have joined forces with Andrea this week and we're combining both our courses. So you can hop on her website, thecancerspecialist.com. And then if you hit the shopping tab or backslash shop, you can grab both our courses for just $5.99, which is a savings of I think my math's right. Is 200 right on that, Andrea? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't I check that. Each of them are normal. <laughs> I know. Both, I have, I have they're to They're both normally mine. 399 so you're, you're right. saving 100 bucks on each course. And if you have done the functional aging specialist or if you've done the cancer specialist, we've got a, a savings for you to, to just grab the one as well. So I think that's all I've got, Andrea. I am open for questions at this point. Yeah, so if uh, that was fantastic, Dan, and, and everything you said was so poignant and people have been writing and, uh, you know, say, saying the same thing and, and uh, I'm trying to pop out this thing so I can read these questions here. Okay, let's see what we got. Um, your certification needs to be added to health and fitness centers like Lifetime to be an accredited cert. I agree. And I don't know if you want to answer that one, Dan. Uh, I have my own opinion on why certs are added or why they're not. Do you want to address that? Um, well, what's the what's the question? Um, I mean, obviously, we well, would... <laughs> We would love. Yeah, it's, it's we'd more love of a statement. So, Sandra, if you want to pose a more specific question, because um, when we apply for CEUs, uh, it's through each individual organization. And let's see, um, we got a question from Amy. I'm moving on until I hear from Sandra. Sure. How much does the functional aging course cover interacting with clients with dementia and other memory loss conditions? Oh, that's a that's a good question, Amy. Um, we do not cover um, specific health conditions. So the functional aging specialist is really designed um, to help you train someone over the age of 55, regardless of health conditions. So there are there are some things that work really well with people with Parkinson's, some things that work really well with people with dementia, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, just a variety of things. But we don't specialize on conditions so for example cancer we don't specifically address it we think you need to go to someone like andrea to get really the specific knowledge on that condition um, same thing for dementia and some of the other conditions so um, there are certainly many things in the functional aging specialist that will help you um, working with people with dementia but there's nothing in it we we immediately said we are not going to try to address all of the uh, chronic health conditions and major diseases, and we we need people like Andrea to do that, right? So, like, if you're working with cancer people regularly, you need to get her course. Um, and so, th there are other courses, and we're actually working on developing a Parkinson's course um, with someone that has trained um, hundreds of people with Parkinson's. Um, but yeah, that I think that kind of addresses your question. Yeah, and and that's you know becoming a medical fitness trainer. I think you know a lot of these a lot of courses um, through various certifying bodies touch on just a little bit of everything, but you really need to get more comprehensive training. So okay, let me move on here. Um, I just had a good one. Uh, wait a minute. All right, somebody has taken the active aging course through Idea Fit, and they're wondering how it compares to your course. Um, so yeah, good question. So Idea actually sells our functional aging specialist. So just like uh, Andrea is selling our functional aging specialist this week, um, people can buy the functional aging specialist through Idea and also through ACE. So it's the same course. So 
you certainly don't need to buy it again. Um, there would it would be the identical course, so you wouldn't want to do that. So we do have a handful of uh, distributors, um, so it's the exact same specialist course. Yeah, and I I have the same thing with the cancer exercise specialist through ACE, and people get confused. Yep. Um, okay, so we're dialing back to Sandra's question about adding the certification to you know various locations. She says, how does she add it? She just got hired as a trainer that she wants to do your certification, but it's not on their list of approved credentials. Yeah, uh, okay, now I get the question, yeah. So, and and we run into this from time to time, especially with some of the major health club chains because the health club chains are like, well, you gotta get ACE certified or NASM certified or NSCA or ACSM. Um, and, and we're getting there. Uh, we now have over 3,000 uh, fitness professionals in the functional aging specialists, and we have certified trainers in 18 countries. So really what I would say is, um, is push for it. So I would go to your boss and say, you know what, I really want to be a functional aging specialist. This is the certification I want to get. It is approved, uh, for continuing ed by ACE, by NASM, by ACSM, um, SCW, NFPT, uh, CAN Fit Pro. I mean, all the major organizations have approved it. Um, and you can even let them know, hey, there are um, thousands in this training certification that just might not be one they've heard of. Um, and I'm not surprised they haven't heard of it because the average health club is not focused on the aging market. Um, so you can even say, hey, this is going to differentiate me and set me apart because most of our trainers are not certified in this. Um, and so, Absolutely. It's, so it's yeah, you're just you're going to have to start fighting for that. We have. Um, we have gotten approved by some facilities. I know Jewish community centers and YMCAs and some of those uh, have been real supportive, but uh, otherwise you're just gonna have to share our website with them and show them. Um, you know, the one thing you can say is the functional aging specialist was developed by two PhDs. Um, most of the personal training certifications were not developed by two PhDs. Um, in fact, it's sort of interesting when you look at how they were developed. Not that they were developed poorly, they just, weren't necessarily developed by two PhDs that have trained thousands of clients. So, um, but yeah, you'll have to probably uh, do a little fighting for that. Okay, great. Um, all right, so Amy is asking you, Dan, what's your opinion of using the leg press with older clients diagnosed with stenosis? Oh boy, that's a great question. Uh, there's a lot there. Um, I guess it would depend in that situation. I would probably want a lot more information from their physician. Um, stenosis can be a pretty significant uh, concern, uh, spinal concern. Um, so I'd probably want to know some restrictions and limitations from the physician. In most cases, I'm not going to be concerned with light leg pressing with that. Uh, a lot of physicians are going to give you a restriction with stenosis, like no leg pressing or no squats or certain sorts of things, which I tend to fight back and say, well, but the client has to get off the chair, right? They've got to get yeah. off a toilet. They have to be able to body weight squat. They've got to be able to do some of those sorts of things. And so I don't see a leg press with half of their body weight as being a huge concern, um, but again, I would, I would want a lot more specifics from the physician, like what can they, or can they not do? What does the physician say they should avoid limit? Um, and then I might even want to further that conversation because sometimes physicians just come back and they're like, well, they have a 10 pound limit. I'm like, well, that's pretty useless too, right? Because, you know, what if this person's 200 pounds and they have spinal stenosis? Um, well, they, they want to be able to get out of a chair. So, uh, a lot of, um, lower body functional strength movements using their body weight is probably where I'm going to start, you know, things like mini lunges and split squats and, um, you know, squats and chair stands and just a variety of things like that. But I, I think you'll probably be fine with using a leg press with light weight if you're just working on muscular endurance. Do you have time for another question or two, Dan? Yeah, I got 10 more minutes. Okay, cool. All right. So uh, Amy is asking what the time limit for finishing both the FAI and cancer cer certification courses. I can tell you for the cancer exercise specialist, it's 180 days. Um, so do you want to answer for your yep, course? It's, yeah, it's basically the same for ours. It's six months, um, which is probably 184 days if you were to <laughs> count, count, it out, count it out. <laughs> so yeah, it's from the time you buy the course, it's it's six months. 
And, you know, another thing to, to let everybody know that in addition to, you know, getting this invaluable information through either or both courses, that we're also helping to uh, draw attention to them as fitness professionals, bringing more um, notoriety to what it is we're doing as opposed to just being an average, you know, run of the mill fitness trainer. So we're trying to help feed clients to you through directories, through working with the Medical Fitness Education Foundation. And this is all part of the training, uh, not just giving you a piece of paper and saying, okay, bye now, go do with it what you will. So uh, I know next month I'm going to also have a webinar on marketing and, and business. And Dan, you have your mastermind session. So I think people should, uh, you know, follow up on that as well to build their business after they get that piece of paper. Yeah. And we have, um, and I, I think you have this as well. We have a, a private Facebook group for our functional aging specialists that get certified. Um, because one of the things that I found in the fitness industry was like, Oh, it's really nice. You're now a certified trainer, but you're, <laughs> right. total, you're totally out in the wilderness on your own in a lot of ways. Um, and yeah, so, yeah. so we said, look, anyone who gets certified through us, we want them to be able to dialogue with one another. And so we have a private Facebook group with hundreds of trainers around the country. And so, you know, some, someone just this week posed a question like, Hey, I have a client with this shoulder issue. What should I do? And there was a huge dialogue of, you know, well, you should read this person's book. You should look at these resources, avoid these exercises, try this, you know, giant discussion with trainers from around the world. And so we have that as a support as well. Yeah, and, and we do as well, but we just started ours, so it, it's it's new, um, but the cool thing is we have trainers that are also cancer patients sharing their private stories, and, right. yeah. you know, ba battles and accomplishments, and um, it's, it's just really amazing, and it's, it's a great synergy, and I'm sure it is with you as well. Um, okay, so that's the time limit. Then let's see, I have another one from Diane. What's the best way to find specific exercises to use with older clients and those with osteoarthritis? Oh, <clears throat> wow. Um, well, Diane, yeah, Diane, <laughs> I would, Diane, I would say just email us, um, contact at functionalagentinstitute.com and, um, and tell Celia that, that Dan said, uh, she was going to provide her resources. I mean, we've got a couple different resources that just have hundreds of exercises. Um, I would say the vast majority of people over 55 are going to have some sort of osteoarthritis somewhere, right? Whether it's in their, their hands, their shoulders, their knees. Um, and so there are so many exercises um, that there's not necessarily like, hey, this is the magic exercise for arthritis, but um, we can give you... Um, access to just a variety of resources. You know, one thing on the note of arthritis, um, at least my generation, Tom Purvis has been a huge speaker and, you know, to some of the new trainers may not be familiar with him, but one thing he said, he said, it's not a question of if you're going to get, get arthritis. It's a question of when right. and how bad. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, I have another question here from Sandra. What is your ex what is your comment or experience with exerbotics? I have. Do you know what that is? No, I don't. I have no idea what that is. Yeah, Sandra, if you can elaborate on that, that that would be helpful because we're both at a loss. <laughs> it's, maybe it's robots doing exercise for us. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what that is. Um, well, while we're waiting for her to write back, I don't have any other questions, but um, anything else you, you want to add, Dan? Your, your information has just been so valuable. Um, I don't think so at this point. I don't know about your course uh, in particular, but I know the functional aging specialist, um, we have a 30-day money-back guarantee so people can check it out, try it, make sure it's a good fit for them. And so I always let people know that are like, well, should I do this? Should this be the next course? Um, you know, even the, the one person who was writing in saying, you know, can I get my health club to approve it? Um, right. You know, you, you have 30 days to, to try it out and see if this is really the credential you want to get, you know. So, um, so that's one thing I always tell people. And then the other thing is I tell people is, look, if you're training people over the age of 50, um, the average personal training certification out there um, just didn't prepare you well for that. And so, no, so this is going to give you 
the, the one difference with ours, and I know yours is the same way, is there's just a lot of content and education, right? It's not just, hey, here's a test, pass it. Um, we're going to we're going to walk you through a 22 Absolutely. videos. You know, we have 22 videos where we walk you through exercise movements and how to train, train older clients. And so it's just going to give you a lot more confidence to be successful. Yeah. And, and we do have uh, the, the 30 day money back. And we also for people who you know aren't ready to make the leap, we have an introduction to cancer exercise, which is, is it's not a certificate. It's not a certification. It's just a handbook. But it kind of allows people to see the content. And if if they're ready for that. You know, a lot of people are scared to work with an older adult. They're scared to work with people with diseases and, you know, God forbid cancer. But as a 34 year cancer survivor myself, um, you know, unfortunately cancer does take the lives of many, but there are so many more that live robust lives. And we are able, as with any older adult, to give them back that self-confidence, to give them back that control over their lives and their bodies. And that is so powerful as a fitness professional. Um, you know, I've been in the industry for a long time, like you, Dan, and for those who are newer and really wanting to set themselves apart from the other trainers at the gym, this is the way to do it. Um, okay, I have an answer to the question. Uh, so that machine focuses on eccentric training for older adults, and um, a couple of people have written in about that. So I'm just trying to see what they're saying here. Um, machine that works on eccentric movement and programs the client's info on the machine and it focuses on the eccentric movement for older people so I mean it's basically redundant but I, I'm not familiar with it yeah I'm not real familiar with it if it's a if it's a machine that is sort of giving someone a focused program anything that's that's focusing eccentric movement is is going to be a positive in terms of strength improvements um, and so like many other tools, I'm sure it's going to be affected in that specific area, right? Like it's going to specifically help people with eccentric loading and eccentric control and eccentric strength. Um, so it's going to be useful for that. Um, having never well, and I, I think with injuries, eccentric training, I know recovering from Achilles tendonitis, one of the things that you focus on is the eccentric phase yeah. uh, of doing a calf raise. So I can see the validity there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, eccentric movement, you're going to get uh, in a lot of cases a lot more bang for your buck. But yeah. um, but again, you're only you're still only training that sort of movement pattern. So um, it's just going to be one one more tool. Um, and, and what you see when you go through our program is you've just got to use a lot of different tools. Um, there's not just one that solves every, every problem. So I think um, Donna, um, I see here at the end of the question box, I see that she says, I have a question there. So she must have asked one earlier that we missed. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I don't see it. I, I apologize, you guys. I'm not good at navigating this. <laughs> so I, I, see, I see it. I, fa I found it. So Donna asked, um, uh, quite a while ago, back at 245. Given that specificity is key, what's the best approach for groups? That's what I do. Work all three planes, and people can self-regulate by sensation, pain, body awareness. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say yes to all that, Donna. So if you're training, it really doesn't matter to me whether you're training one person, six people, or 12 people. Um, specificity is still the key, and we got to train all three planes of motion because that's what we move in. So you've got to have a mix of frontal plane, sagittal plane, and transverse plane across your session. Um, obviously, when you're working with groups, you're going to have more variability in terms of you know body awareness. You're going to have more of a variability in terms of well, this exercise causes me pain. Um, so you're going to have to be more adaptable and and modifiable to changing exercises for people based on their pain and body awareness. But, but really the, the principles don't change whether I'm training one people or 10 people, I got to be training all three planes. I got to be training um, things like center of gravity control and balance and, and proprioception and sensation and somata sensation and touch. And, um, and some things are, are, you know, going to bother some people's knees that don't bother other people's knees and I'll have to be able to adjust quickly on the fly. So so yeah, specificity is still key whether we're training one person or, or 20 people. Yeah, and I apologize, Don. I thought that was a statement as opposed to a question. So I'm glad you found that, uh, Dan. Um, somebody, Martha is asking if you have some classes in stroke recovery. 
Um, <clears throat> we don't have any specific ones here. We have worked with a number of stroke recovery uh, clients. Almost all of them have been one-on-one, -on -one, um, but absolutely you could do, um, I don't know that I'd be a huge fan of large group fitness for stroke recovery, but you could certainly do small group personal training, you know, three to six clients. Um, the, the challenge you're gonna have with stroke recovery is, is safety um, and a wide range of functional ability, right? You might have one stroke recovery person that's got great lower body strength and balance and the next person's got terrible balance and is a fall risk, um, but you absolutely could do group stuff for stroke recovery. Um, and, and we've got a lot of good principles in our course for that as well. Okay, Gina asked a question earlier uh, and you, maybe she needs to contact us separately, but she wants to do a presentation to market her small group personal training and is asking if she has permission to utilize these slides in a presentation. Yes, absolutely. So probably the best thing to do for Gina is to reach out to us via email, the contact at Functional Aging Institute and just say, hey, I'm looking for Dan's presentation from the webinar today, and uh, we can send that over to you. So you're going to want to use, um, you know, some of the slides like the functional aging trajectory, and you're going to want to use the, uh, we strongly encourage our functional aging specialists to use the function diagrams where when you show that to a client in their 70s, and they're like, whoa, there's six domains of human function, and my doctor told me I should walk you quickly flip yeah. the conversation like there's there's nothing wrong with the advice your doctor gave you your doctor just doesn't know enough about exercise and function for longevity they weren't trained for that right like your physician wasn't trained for that i'm not trained for how 17 different medications interact with one another i trust your physician knows that stuff so so but then the the patient sitting there with you goes oh uh, my doctor meant well, they just didn't really give me the full picture. And so now you position yourself as a, an expert alongside the physician. Um, so yeah, we're happy to, happy to send that stuff to you. Great. And one last thing, Rosie Barton, who is a cancer exercise specialist, and thank you for the accolades, Rosie. I appreciate that. She asks you if you have good reference uh, to go to for ideas for the training of dementia clients. Um, I don't at the moment, um, probably I would direct Rosie, um, to, to two, two places. One, I, I would refer her to, uh, the webinar we did with Ryan Glatt on, on cognitive training. Um, and then I would encourage Rosie to look at activate brain and body, um, activate brain and body. Uh, we're actually on the board for their developing uh, an entire brain fitness program alongside a functional fitness program. Um, and so I don't have any great tangible resources. Just say, hey, Rosie, go go take a look at this. But um, the webinar we did with Ryan Glatt uh, a month ago um, on cognitive training was really, really useful. And watch for us um, in the next three to six months. We're going to be putting out a course on cognitive enhancement training with Ryan Glatt. Um, who has, has spent uh, a number of years in the neuroscience area because th they sort of come together. We don't really want to train cognitive separate from fitness. We want to try to figure out how to bring them together. So, so at the moment, I don't have anything for Rosie, but we are working on it. Okay, there's one last question and then I guess we probably have to wrap it up. And this is from Charles and I, I'm not sure I'm, if I'm gonna botch this up. Uh, do you have any experience with incomplete SCI and then the greater than? sign people so i'm not exactly sure what the question is on that maybe you can decipher it i'm not either without um him spelling out sci for us um so i'm guessing since yeah, I, don't, I don't i'm I don't guessing since i don't know the acronym sci i probably I don't know. charles I'm like, <laughs> sacro iliac <laughs> right, right. So, but yeah i wasn't well, i'm not sure sci um yeah, I, I mean, Charles, if you're still there and, and we uh, leave this webinar, you're welcome to email either uh, Dan or I and, and we can uh, expand upon that. But I don't see anything coming. Oh, wait, spinal cord injury. OK, there uh, we go. Yeah. Thank you, okay. Charles. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yes, Charles, I have some. I, I have worked with um, uh, a small number, but 
Um, that has not been our focus. Um, you know, since our focus is primarily people over 55, um, which certainly some do have spinal cord injury, but that special population has not been our focus. So um, be happy to talk more about it. I've certainly worked with individuals, um, a fair number actually over the years, um, and almost all of them have been young, um, people in their 20s and 30s, um, but not uh, certainly not something we cover in the functional aging specialist certainly not one of our focuses on the, the aging market, but spinal cord injuries are certainly something that the fitness pro needs to, um, needs to be knowledgeable of, but that's not something that we do at FAI. Yeah, we get into a lot of spinal cord compression and epidural spinal cord compression in the cancer exercise specialist training. Uh, there, there's, there's a good amount in there, but obviously that's, that's not the general population. Right, right. Okay, well, thank you to everybody for joining us today, and a big thank you to you, Dan, for sharing your expertise, and hopefully um, you guys will take advantage of this amazing special. If you have any questions, feel free to contact either of us privately. Um, Dan, did you provide them with an email address to contact you, or you, you gave them the website? I did. It was on the uh, the previous slide here as well. Okay. So uh, contact at functionalagentinstitute.com is the best way to reach us. Um, Celia usually responds within within a couple hours, but for sure within 24 hours. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. And for those of you who are watching the replay, I uh, hope you enjoy what Dan has to say. And uh, good luck with everybody in your educational endeavors. All right, thanks so much, Andrea. Thanks, Dan.